Good evening, I'm Stephen Romo in for Gotti Schwartz, and we begin with breaking news as we come on the air tonight. An ISIS-affiliated news outlet says the terror group is claiming responsibility for the deadly shootings and explosion at a concert hall in Moscow. At least 40 people are reported dead, and more than 100 others are hurt, including some children. Now, here's what we know so far. It's Russia's deadliest attack inside the capital in years, and it unfolded this evening inside a popular concert venue where a rock band was set to play to a sold-out crowd. Russian state news says several gunmen dressed in camouflage stormed inside and started shooting. We do have some video of the moments this all started, but we do want to warn you, it may be disturbing to watch. terrifying ordeal there and images from outside the building show it covered in flames after the attack that fire so large the roof of the venue partially collapsed that is according to russian state media the u.s state department has now issued a warning to americans in moscow to avoid that area and this comes just two weeks since the embassy in russia reported they were monitoring the potential for extremist attacks nbc news reporter matt bodner joins me now with the latest on this now what else do we know about the attack and do we know, is anyone in custody? Thank you, Stephen. Well, we're not actually getting uh, too much information from the Russian authorities themselves. Really, uh, in terms of, of, of official commentary, it's so far been mostly lower level city and, and federal employees. So I think we're still kind of waiting for high level Kremlin response, high level security forces response. Um, suffice it to say, they have not yet claimed to have taken anyone into custody. Uh, we do know that there's a search going on. Uh, they've initiated kind of an investigation under criminal under criminal articles. So uh, they are starting to make their moves. We just haven't heard anything yet about what they're doing. So kind of everything that we're, we've been getting is as you've as you just showed us here, uh, social media uh, 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 footage taken by people who were there, and uh, it's a very chaotic, difficult to watch scene. We're talking. Um, at least three gunmen. Uh, uh, that number could end up being more, of course, uh, in the final tally. But um, this was a sizable attack that began very quickly. And you can kind of see the confusion in these videos. People, uh, for example, you know, hearing, hearing a lot of gunfire and assuming that it was construction. It's just kind of so out of the ordinary, even in Moscow, where drones, Ukrainian drones have been striking. So um, that's, that's what the picture looks like right now, Stephen. Yeah, so much that we're hearing about this coming from social media and uh, still a lot of moving parts here. That number uh, of 40 killed, it is held for a while now. Do we expect at all the number of those killed or injured? Is that expected to rise? I, I think kind of with, with as with any any situation like this, that's certainly the case. Um, we, we're seeing that 40 number hold right now, but just kind of unconfirmed on Russian social media. For example, you're starting to see uh, from some of the pro-government Kremlin channels who who are believed to, to get information from the security services that there are higher numbers that we still might see confirmed. Um, so we're keeping an eye on that. You know, they're still trying to secure the area. And this was, as we can all see, a very large, very large event. So um, there still could be updates to those numbers by, by the morning. Alarming, especially given that it's reported to have been a sold out crowd there. And Matt, we also know that the uh, U.S. Embassy warned about the threat of a potential terrorist attack two weeks ago. Now, of course, ISIS appearing to take credit for this. Were there specific indications that something like this could happen? This is in, I think, a really interesting question, Stephen. And, and I think the outcome of the story in the near term depends a lot on, on, on what we learn about this. Of course, we have the United States having come out um, essentially backing up this story that the U.S. was warning, was sharing information about a threat. Now, we don't know how specific this information was, but I think it's fair to say that historically, the United States and Russia have been very active in exchanging information on counterintelligence. Obviously, this is one of those relationships that has suffered greatly um, during, because of the war in Ukraine and just um, a complete breakdown of U.S.-Russia relations. So historically, information is traded. It's, it's plausible that the U.S. was trying to warn something, warn of something quite credible. I think the really interesting rub here is just three days ago, President Putin publicly uh, himself acknowledged this, saying uh, while speaking, it was kind of an event for the FSB, the security services, 
um, and in which Putin said, uh, you know, addressed warnings from the United States and was writing them off as, as obvious provocations. They were meant to destabilize Russian society. So uh, this element of the story, I think, is, is going to be an important one over the weekend and moving forward, um, because a, a lot of the mechanics of it, I think, can drive Russia in a few different directions from here. Stephen. All right. Matt Bodner, thanks so much for that update. And more to come on this. Let's bring in NBC News national security analyst and former assistant director for counterintelligence at the FBI, Frank Figluzzi. Thanks so much for being here, Frank. So this is being called a terror attack. Now, ISIS reportedly claiming responsibility for it. How does that affect the investigation and aftermath here? And how is Russia likely to respond? Yeah, Stephen, that is one of the key things I'll be watching is how Putin and his administration responds to this. Will he use it, for example, to justify a crackdown on civil liberties throughout his country? Will he lash out at all Muslims? What will he do with this? Will he attempt, um, with some difficulty, I might add, to blame Ukraine for this? I say with some difficulty because there's absolutely no indication of that. And quite the contrary, as you've reported, the U.S. State Department had, had issued an alert uh, two weeks ago saying, we, we have intelligence. And by the way, specific intelligence, that reporting out of the State Department, out of the uh, U.S. Embassy in Moscow, said specifically large gatherings, including concerts. So when you look at the terrorism angle here, you're clearly looking at some entity that the U.S. government was dialed in very tightly on. And what would that be? a terrorist cell or organization with such specificity that they felt it necessary to issue this warning. Now, we also should be watching the reaction of the Russian people. Um, they've already lost their sons, their brothers, their fathers in the Ukraine war. Now they may be feeling, as indicated early on on social media already in Russia, that Putin can't protect them. So if they're not safe abroad, they're not safe at home. Putin reportedly ignoring a warning from the U.S. How will the Russian people respond? Yeah, and, and on that topic, you mentioned uh, Ukraine. We know an advisor for President Zelensky has already said that Ukraine had nothing to do with this. But on the topic of the Russian people, I know Putin was just reelected just days ago, even though there was really no other contender. So much of his persona seems to be about uh, control and being a strong man, keeping order. How will the Russian people continue to see him uh, in light of an attack like this? He looks particularly bad in this incident um, because word will get out, even though it's hard in Russia for truth to get out, word will get out that he essentially blew off or dismissed a warning from the United States. Uh, there's been reports uh, just before we went on the air that he's now going back to the U.S. and saying, can we have more details on the intel you have? Furthermore, there's been reporting that two weeks ago, Russian agents went to Kazakhstan and killed two members of a terror cell that were allegedly plotting an attack on a, Mount, a Moscow synagogue. So it might be that Putin thought everything was good. He had put down the threat. And now in front of his people, he's got to, you know, he's got to admit we did not put down this threat. It'll be interesting to see how this continues to play out. Frank Vigluzzi, thanks so much. And we're following some more big news from overseas today. Kate Middleton, the Princess of Wales, announcing that she's been diagnosed with cancer and has started chemotherapy. Now, this news is a sad postscript to weeks of wild speculation and rumors, even conspiracy theories about why she hasn't been in the public eye. Well, today in the video posted online, the princess explained why she kept her cancer diagnosis private up until now, emphasizing the importance of her children. As you can imagine, this has taken time. It has taken me time to recover from major surgery in order to start my treatment. But most importantly, it has taken us time to explain everything to George, Charlotte and Louis in a way that's appropriate for them and to reassure them that I'm going to be OK. Now, it's important to point out, we don't know the type of cancer or the severity, but Kensington Palace says the princess has started chemo in late February. NBC News international correspondent Molly Hunter has more. It has been an incredibly tough couple of months for our entire family. Tonight, after months away from her royal duties out of the public eye, a deeply personal update from the Princess of Wales. In January, I underwent major abdominal surgery in London, and at the time, it was thought that my condition was non-cancerous. The surgery was successful. However, tests after the operation found cancer had been present. 
My medical team therefore advised that I should undergo a course of preventative chemotherapy and I'm now in the early stages of that treatment. This of course came as a huge shock and William and I have been doing everything we can to process and manage this privately for the sake of our young family. Kate's health has been the subject of speculation and wild conspiracy theories for weeks, only heightened by a Mother's Day photo which the 42-year-old later apologized for altering. And just days ago, UK media reports that the clinic where Kate underwent surgery back in January could be investigating three staffers for allegedly trying to access her medical records. It has taken me time to recover from major surgery in order to start my treatment, but most importantly, it has taken us time to explain everything to George, Charlotte and Louis in a way that's appropriate for them and to reassure them that I'm going to be okay. Kate also highlighting the support she's received from the Prince of Wales. Having William by my side is a great source of comfort and reassurance too, as is the love, support and kindness that has been shown by so many of you. It means so much to us both. 75-year-old King Charles is also being treated for an undisclosed cancer discovered during a January prostate procedure. Tonight, the King saying he is so proud of Catherine for her courage in speaking as she did. And from California, Harry and Meghan saying, we wish health and healing for Kate and the family and hope they're able to do so privately and in peace. No matter how you look at this news, it is clear that the royal family is in crisis. This not only is a crisis for a family, a family of human beings, a grandfather, a son, parents, but this is a crisis for the royal family as an institution. Tonight, messages of support coming in from around the world. And we'll be praying for them. We will be, we'll be praying for the family. They've been through the mill a little bit over the last few years. We wish her a full recovery. And Kate's brother saying, over the years, we have climbed many mountains together as a family. We will climb this one with you, too. As she continues her treatment, Kate asking for privacy for her family. We hope that you'll understand that as a family, we now need some time, space and privacy while I complete my treatment. My work has always brought me a deep sense of joy and I look forward to being back when I'm able. But for now, I must focus on making a full recovery. And at the end of her video message, the Princess of Wales taking the time to offer words of comfort and hope for those also affected by cancer. For everyone facing this disease, in whatever form, please do not lose faith or hope. You are not alone. And Stephen, we're not expecting any more updates from Kensington Palace. Certainly no rolling updates on how her treatment is going from the palace. They have not revealed what type of cancer she has. And Stephen, as far as when we'll see her next, there was initially the expectation we would see her over Easter. What is clear tonight is that recovery is her priority. And so Kensington Palace has not committed to a date. Stephen. Molly Hunter, thanks so much. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Natalie Azar joins us now to talk more about this. Uh, Dr. Azar, thanks for being here. Uh, cancer has affected just the lives of so many people. We don't want to speculate on the type of cancer here, but the details using chemotherapy as a preventative measure, uh, how common is that? And hearing about this course of treatment as a physician, does that tell you anything about where she might be with this diagnosis? Yeah, I mean, those are all fair questions, Stephen. And, and as you said, we don't know the type of, of cancer that she was diagnosed with. We don't know, you know, anything really about, about the organ that it's involving um, or the biology of the tumor. So we really can't speculate completely. But what I can say is that, no, it's not atypical at all to give somebody preventative chemo after a surgical resection. There's always the possibility that, you know, microscopic uh, cancer cells could, could be present that weren't, you know, visible, uh, you know, to the surgeon, for example. Um, so, you know, that said, uh, it's definitely more encouraging to hear that than to hear that, um, you know, she's going to be undergoing a treatment course of chemo for for cancer that is still present. Um, you know, a full resection um, is presumed here, given what they've told us. Um, but it doesn't give us really any indication about what type it actually is. And Kate is still expected to attend some events as she undergoes this treatment. Is that at all surprising to you? Would you expect she might be dealing with side effects from chemo? Right. I mean, and she looked really, she looked good in the video. You know, I know, um, you know, looks can be deceiving, but 
Um, you know, listen, with, with chemotherapy, not, not all drugs are created equal. Some are clearly more associated with severe side effects than others. What I will say is that oncologists have uh, become so expert at preventing a lot of the, you know, sort of stereotypical side effects of chemo, such as nausea and things like that. But there are certain things that you can't really control for, like, you know, a drop in, in counts and becoming anemic and those kinds of things sometimes take a little while, um, you know, to really manifest fully. In a, in, and it appears that she started her treatment a, a month ago. Um, so, you know, it, it's possible that she still has a, a, a lot to go through um, physically before she gets to the other side of this. But as I said, sounds like she has a really good medical team and, and they will certainly be monitoring for and, and treating her for all of those potential uh, side effects of chemo, Stephen. Yeah, certainly a lot of side effects that could be uh, brought on by this. And that, of course, all on the physical side. But Absolutely. there's an emotional one, too. How do you see the mental health component of all this, especially since she's the mother of these three young children, which she's obviously very concerned about? Yeah. Um, you know, and again, it's so hard because we know when, when you're on the outside looking in and as a medical profession, we know that not all cancers are created equal. There are some that, you know, you hear the diagnosis and it's just a, you know, a devastating blow. And then once you get, you know, a, a couple of days behind you, you say, you know what, I can beat this and the odds are good. Um, but it doesn't change the fact that you have a diagnosis of cancer and anyone who's either experienced it or has a loved one who goes through it. It's terrifying, you know. It's it, it changes your whole sort of outlook on life and changes your perceptions about yourself. Um, you know, understanding that she's already gone through major surgery and she's missing certain organs, and you know that that takes a toll as a mother. Knowing that you have three young children who are dependent on you just adds another layer, um, you know, of of sort of psychological complexity and impact. And so, you know. I, it sounds like she's leaning on William, which doesn't surprise me. And hopefully she she does have the support of her friends and family. And I think we as an international community, it's time for us to sort of say, you know what, have, you know, peace and and, you know, we encourage you to, to heal and get better. Um, and hopefully, Sunny, your days are ahead for her. Yeah, certainly hope so. And doing all this in the public eye, uh, even as another complication to it, hoping that she can get some of the privacy she's asked for. Dr. Natalie Azar, thank you so much for that insight. You bet. And don't go anywhere. We are just getting started tonight. Up next, it's a sad end to the search for that college student who went missing in Nashville. Police found his body in a river today, but questions remain on exactly how he got there. We've got the latest on that investigation. Plus, the inmate who escaped in Idaho appeared in court today as a third suspect is also now under arrest for the escape. And later this hour, we're talking about the future of fertility and how younger women are now freezing their eggs. That's coming up in the future of everything, so stay tuned. Hi, I'm Shania, and I am freezing my eggs, and I'm 25 years old. Welcome back. Here are some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. On Capitol Hill today, the House passed a $1.2 trillion spending bill to avoid a government shutdown. Some hard right Republicans did not take kindly to the bipartisan legislation, though, to keep the government open. One of them, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, even filed a motion to oust Speaker Mike Johnson as a result. And turns out an Arkansas airport executive killed during a shootout with the FBI was under investigation for illegal arms sales. 53-year-old Brian Malinowski was in, in charge of Little Rock's Bill and Hillary Clinton National Airport. Officials say he was shot after he opened fire on the FBI when they showed up to his house to serve a search warrant. In Oklahoma, no charges will be filed after trans high school student Nex Benedict died by suicide. Nex said three students jumped him in the day before he ended up taking his own life at just 16 years old. Tulsa County's district attorney said the fight appeared to be, quote, an instance of mutual combat. A federal appeals court has ordered a judge to investigate whether there was a juror bias in the Boston Marathon bombing case. It turns out to be the case, if it turns out to be the case, the death sentence of convicted bomber Jokar Sarnayev could be thrown out. However, he will stay in prison for the rest of his life, regardless of that outcome. The 2013 bombing killed three people and left more than 260 others hurt. And listen up, Starbucks lovers, Nestle USA is recalling more than 440 
1,000 Starbucks branded holiday mugs after customers reported the mugs were overheating or breaking after being microwaved. In all, 10 injuries were reported, including nine severe burns and blisters. Those mugs were sold at Target and Walmart. Well, tonight, loved ones of missing University of Missouri student Riley Strain are struggling with this terrible loss after their worst fears ended up coming true. Nashville police confirmed his body was found in a river earlier today. Now, this comes two weeks after he was reported missing. It, it's closure in a way, but it's not the outcome that anybody wanted. I mean, this is not, we wanted to bring him home alive. I wanted to help it bring him home alive. I wanted, I wanted them to hear Riley's voice again. I wanted to give Riley a big hug after I helped find him. So heartbreaking. That 22-year-old was in Nashville on a trip with his fraternity when he was kicked out of a bar on March 8th. Now, surveillance video showed him stumbling through the streets alone, marking the last time he was seen alive. Now, that kicked off a massive search that eventually led police to the Cumberland River, where his debit card was found earlier this week. Police say right now foul play is not suspected. NBC News correspondent Kathy Park joins me now from Nashville with more on this. Now, Kathy, this is just such a devastating end to this for the family and friends who are holding out hope, many of them involved in that two-week search. How was his body finally found, found and what happens next year? Yeah, Stephen, good evening. It certainly has been a heartbreaking turn of events on a story that we've been following very closely for the past two weeks. According to Nashville Police, we learned that earlier this morning, workers who were out on the barge, um, they actually pulled it up, and that's when they discovered Riley's body. This was about eight miles downriver from where we are standing, and this is kind of the vicinity where he was last seen. And according to Nashville police chief, he said uh, there was no sign of foul play, and this appears to be just a tragic accident. Take a listen. Normally, uh, under these circumstances, with, with his height and weight, that he could have surfaced between 14 and 20 days. Uh, this is the 14th day, uh, so we were uh, really expecting uh, anytime soon to, uh, to find him. Now, the police chief went on to say that Riley was seen wearing the same shirt and the watch he was last seen wearing on the night of March 8th. That is the night he disappeared. He also said that an autopsy is now underway. It's unclear when we will get the results of the autopsy. Meanwhile, officials here in Nashville, in the wake of what's happened, they want to secure the riverbank here so that they can prevent other tragedies like this from ever happening again. Just 22 years old. So sad. Kathy, do we know at all how his family is doing tonight? Yeah, as you can imagine, they're heartbroken. I had a chance to speak with them several times throughout the, the past two weeks, and this has been their worst nightmare. Um, I can tell you they were on the ground the minute they learned that he was missing. He's originally from Springfield, Missouri, so several family members traveled to this location the minute they learned that they couldn't find Riley. And they've been on the ground um, just searching the riverbank, asking strangers if they've seen Riley passing out flyers. Uh, we heard from family members earlier today and especially his, his mother who had this message to say. Take a listen. I just ask that you mamas out there hug your babies tight tonight, please. Please for me to hug your babies tight tonight. And again, thank you. Thank you for sharing our story. So. Yeah, and other families chimed in saying that they are just so grateful for the outpouring of support. Uh, there were volunteers here in Nashville, but other volunteers who came from other parts of the country, including the United Cajun Navy, um, they typically respond to natural disasters. And they were here bringing resources, doing everything they could to find Riley over the last two weeks. And unfortunately, um, just a terrible turn of events and uh, a terrible update this evening. Stephen? Such a, a sad update. Kathy Park, thank you. Welcome back. There are even more twists and turns of that story of the escaped inmate in Ohio, in Idaho, rather. We'll have more on that coming up in just a moment. But first, here are some other stories we're following out west. Major League Baseball is launching an investigation into the former interpreter of Los Angeles Dow Dodgers superstar Shohei Otani. Otani's lawyers have accused Ipe Mazuhara of massive theft to pay off gambling debts. 
Authorities in Orange County, California are looking for a 20-year-old man convicted of killing his mother. He walked away from a halfway house Wednesday night in Santa Ana. Police say the man is an extremely dangerous and violent criminal. He escaped from a juvenile detention center back in 2019 and another halfway house in 2022. And State Farm Insurance is cutting coverage for 72,000 houses and apartments in California this summer. Now, this move comes after the insurance giant said it would not add any new home policies in the state last year. State Farm cited surging costs due to increased risk of catastrophes like wildfires, along with some outdated regulations. We've got new details tonight in that wild story about the maximum security inmate who escaped from an Idaho hospital. Authorities captured him and an accomplice yesterday. Tonight, they've arrested a third person in connection to that case. Tanya Huber has been charged with eluding authorities and possession of a controlled substance. Now, this comes as officials are investigating whether the two men may be linked to two other homicides. Let's bring in NBC News correspondent Adrian Broaddus with the latest on this. So, Adrian, and even more developments coming today on this, including an arraignment. If you would walk us through the latest that we know on the investigation, how they were able to pull this all off, and what we know about the potential link to those other homicides. Indeed, Stephen, so much going on here. Let's begin with that tough discovery. Investigators say when the criminals left that hospital in Boise, Idaho, they drove north. At some point, they encountered an 83-year-old man who was out walking his dog. That man is James Mowney. Now, investigators say in his Chrysler Pacifica, those men drew, drove a little further east. And detectives say they found the body of that 83-year-old man near the initial car. You may remember that Honda Civic, the gray vehicle, Meade, and his accomplice, Umpenauer, used to get away. But that's not where the bad news ends. They also found a 72-year-old man dead. He had been reported missing, and that is what led police to do a welfare check at that 72-year-old man's home. Now, the person who reported this 72-year-old man missing also told investigators the 72-year-old said Umpenhauer paid him a visit last week. It's unclear how the two men were killed. Investigators do not believe uh, the two men, the two criminals, knew the 83-year-old, but there was some tie to the 72-year-old, Stephen. Hmm. Well, a lot more developments there. And also, we still have this third arrest at Tanya Huber. What do we know about her and how she could be connected to all this? She's a 52-year-old woman who is facing um, multiple charges, including harboring fugitives. Investigators say she was driving the vehicle moments before Meade was arrested. Listen in. In the felony eluding, she was driving 100 miles an hour through neighborhoods in Twin Falls in an attempt to further the escape of these two men who were wanted on violent felony charges. When she was finally stopped uh, in the uh, parking lot of a store in the middle of the day, um, she was found to possess uh, fentanyl on her person. So multiple charges there for Tanya. Her bond was set at $500,000. You saw her in court there. Meade and his accomplice, Umfenauer, were also arraigned today. Their bail set at $2 million. Stephen? Wow, a lot of developments today and still some questions. NBC's Adrian Broaddus, thanks so much. Still to come tonight, struggling to survive in Haiti, the violence growing in the nation's gang-controlled capital city. We're on the ground near the border with the Dominican Republic, hearing from people doing whatever they can to keep pushing forward. Stay with us. Welcome back. A prominent gang leader in Haiti has been shot dead by police. That story coming up in just a minute. But first, let's take another quick look around the world. Much of Ukraine is in the dark tonight after Russian forces attacked power stations there, killing at least five people and causing widespread blackouts. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky says the bombardment involved more than 100 drones and missiles. At least one of those hit the country's largest dam, which supplies electricity to Europe's largest nuclear power plant. 
A pretty big earthquake struck the eastern coast of Indonesia today. Local news outlets say the magnitude 6.5 quake damaged a number of buildings, but there are no immediate reports of anyone being hurt, nor has there been any risk of a tsunami reported. And for the first time in history, Canada is looking to put a cap on the number of temporary residents it lets into the country. This includes international students, foreign workers, and asylum seekers. It knocks the number down from 6.2% of the population to 5% of the population. Canada's immigration minister points to the country's housing crisis as a reason for that cap. And remember Luis Rubiales, the former Spanish soccer chief who lost his job for forcibly kissing a female player? Well, he's in trouble again. Rubiales is part of the investigation accusing him of corruption and money laundering. Specifically, he's being looked at for allegedly using money from Spain's soccer federation to pay for personal expenses. He also allegedly hosted a sex party paid for with money from the federation. All right, turning now to Haiti, where a gang leader has been killed in the capital city. A police operation took out the Delmas 95 gang leader known as T. Greg. He has been recently escaped from a Haitian prison during a massive jailbreak. Now, all this comes over the transitional council time as those plans continue to be finalized. The UN saying that group would take over any sort of presidential responsibility until the next elections. NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber has more from near Haiti's border. Once again, bullets whizzing through the streets of Port-au-Prince as the National Police Force struggles to release Haiti's capital city from the grip of gangs. Bodies left where they fell, next to gas pumps and collapsed wooded platforms. In between the burst of gunfire, people desperately search for their next meal. Sky News' Stuart Ramsey is in Port-au-Prince. Well, I'm in Port-au-Prince, the capital of Haiti. The people here have no idea when gang violence is going to flare and the whole of the city has been beset with it for days and days now. So much so that people are now building barricades to try and stop the gangs getting through. Many Haitians now face an unbearable choice. Venture outside and risk being shot or stay inside and go hungry. Roughly 1.4 million Haitians are on the verge of famine, according to the UN, and more than 4 million need food. Haitians who have temporarily been allowed to cross into the Dominican Republic are coming to this market to sell, oftentimes, what little belongings they have to get food, things like eggs, so they can then take it back to their families who are still waiting on the other side in Haiti. Samuel is 18. He tells us he lives in Haiti but comes here to work and take food back to his family. Many innocent people are dying, he says. We do not want violence. We want a free country. Haiti's acting president and prime minister Ariel Henry has said he will resign as soon as a transitional presidential council is in place. On Monday, the group involved in negotiating that council, CARICOM, they said that they had come up with the names of people who will be on that council. They've reached an agreement with all of the parties involved. They say, though, this agreement is just the first step. The chair of CARICOM asked for patience, telling people that there are many more steps still to come. Stephen. Ellison Barber, thank you. Well, today, Russia and China vetoed a U.N. resolution proposed by the United States that would have brought an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. NBC News international correspondent Raf Sanchez has more. The United Nations Security Council once again paralyzed after Russia and China vetoing that American resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza linked to the release of the hostages. Now, there's been no formal reaction at this point from the Israeli government, but it's unlikely Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is too disappointed about the failure of this resolution. The Biden administration brought it up partly as a way of signaling that it will not accept an open-ended war in Gaza. And Secretary of State Antony Blinken here in Israel today discussing with the Israeli government 
an issue that is deeply dividing the allies right now. That is Israel's plans for an attack on the city of Rafah in southern Gaza, which we've talked so much about. Israel says it is necessary to go in on the grounds there to destroy the remaining Hamas battalions hiding in the city. The Biden administration saying that with more than a million Palestinian civilians sheltering there, any Israeli ground offensive would be a disaster and that the United States opposes it. Prime Minister Netanyahu today thanking the U.S. for its support over the course of this war, but going further than he has previously, saying Israel will go into Rafah with or without American support. Now, this sets up a series of high-stakes meetings in Washington next week. Two of Netanyahu's most senior advisors are going to be at the White House. They're going to at least put on a show of listening to American concerns about Rafa, the Biden administration, hoping to convince them that there are alternatives to a large-scale ground assault, ways that Israel can still achieve its objectives without a massive attack that endangers civilian lives. We are also going to see Israel's defense minister at the Pentagon. Meanwhile, inside of Gaza, Israel's military raid on the Al-Shifa hospital continues for a fifth day. Israel says it has killed more than 150 militants inside the hospital. It says that it has captured a number of senior Hamas operatives. But humanitarian organizations, including the World Health Organization, raising the alarm, saying that Israeli forces have arrested a number of medical workers and other civilians. There are thousands of displaced people sheltering at that hospital. They are describing a terrifying scene, no water, no electricity, and gunfire all around. So another day of deepening crisis inside of Gaza and the U.N. once again unable to reach a consensus to do anything about it. Back to you. Raf Sanchez, thanks for that report. Before we go, our favorite segment of the week, much needed 60 seconds of joy. Plus tonight's future of everything, a story that might be hard to believe, and it's not all Gouda news. You see where this is going? We, why the future of some well-known French cheeses might be in trouble. Love all the dad jokes there. Stay tuned. In the future of everything, we're talking about the future of fertility. A growing number of women in their 20s are freezing their eggs. But as the procedure is becoming increasingly more popular, it's also quite expensive. But now more employers are offering to cover the steep costs often associated with that procedure. So more women putting that pro procreation plans on literal ice. NBC News Now anchor Savannah Sellers has that story. Hi, I'm Shania, and I am freezing my eggs, and I'm 25 years old. Shania Bopa documented everything about her egg freezing journey, from that first shot of hormones... I don't know if I can do this. ...to the final one at the Toronto Maple Leafs game. Her videos, her age, catching a lot of attention. How many people watch this? Over 10 million views. So quite a few. <laughs> so why 25 instead of 28, 29, 30? The main reason is... A, my insurance was covering the medication costs, and B, this is the youngest my eggs and the best quality they'll ever be in my life. And if I know this is something I want for future me, why not do it now? Egg freezing allows a woman to preserve her fertility, her eggs, and it's becoming a more common work perk. In 2022, some 16% of large employers offered coverage for the procedure, according to benefits consultant Mercer. Now, physicians like Dr. Brooke Wirtz at NYU Langone are seeing younger women walk through the door. Is this something you're actually seeing here at this clinic? Yeah, absolutely. When we first rolled out egg freezing, the percentage of patients under 30 that were coming in were about 1%. And now we're about 10% of our patients are coming in. And the amount of egg freezing we're doing has increased fivefold in the last 10 years. I've done two rounds of egg freezing and I have 23 eggs frozen. When then 25-year-old Katie learned her tech company offered egg freezing as a benefit, she decided to go for it. It allows me to put my career first. It also allows me to really focus on finding the right partner. 
What do you think about those early 20s, mid 20s being a time to do this? I love it. I want to freeze eggs in patients that are young. They're going to get more eggs. They're going to get healthier quality eggs. And that's who egg thawing and egg freezing really works in. A 2022 NYU Langone study shows age does matter for all of the patients who returned to use their eggs. The live birth rate was 39%. But of those who froze under the age of 38, that success rate went up to 50%. As for the downsides, it's a two-week commitment full of appointments and hormonal shots meant to stimulate egg growth. I felt like my ovaries went from little clementines to grapefruits. Like, you feel really swollen. And the price? Without coverage, it costs an average of $16,000 to retrieve and freeze eggs, a figure that can vary across the country. And storage of those eggs can be between 500 and 1,000 a year. A cost these 20-somethings could potentially carry for longer. But that doesn't phase this New Yorker. It's the cheapest rent in New York City. And when women go to use those eggs, it's far from guaranteed they'll turn into babies. Is this an insurance policy in the way that we mean it, which is a way to have a baby later if you want it? I would not characterize it as an insurance policy. Eggs have a lot they still have to do. They have to survive a thaw, fertilize, grow, be healthy, and that's quite variable. And now there's a new complication. The Alabama ruling happened on the day of my retrievals. 33-year-old Alex Barron did two retrievals in Austin, Texas, and fears Texas may move in the direction of Alabama, defining embryos as children, which caused some clinics in that state to halt IVF services. I'm scared to see what's to come, not just about embryos, but eggs in the future. Barron isn't waiting to see how it plays out. I would like to get them to Pennsylvania as soon as possible. Freezing your eggs, a personal, potentially expensive choice with no guaranteed outcomes, but for more young women, it's worth it. Does having done this in some way feel like a weight lifted off your shoulders? Definitely. I feel less stressed about my potential career and goals. Fascinating stuff. Savannah Sellers, thank you. Now to the future of Charcuterie boards, kind of, as France's most popular cheese appears to be on the verge of extinction. NBC's Josh Letterman explains. In the lush green hills of Normandy, they've been making camembert since the 18th century. A cheese so beloved, it was part of French soldiers' rations during World War I. Now crafted by huge manufacturers and on tiny farms in the town of Camembert where Oud Semenzef makes it the old-fashioned way. Camembert is there at each step of our history, so there is a strong link, I think, with the French culture. But now there's a problem. Like other cheeses, Camembert gets its unique taste and smell from a fungus, naturally occurring in the caves where it was once made. There was a big producer Cheese expert Emily Monaco says that made each Camembert just a bit different. Some of them are going to be a little redder or a little bluer or a little grayer. And what people realized um, was that people really like the sort of white, pristine look of camembert. So in the 1900s, scientists perfected that perfect albino strain in the lab, and all the cheesemakers started using it. When we domesticate plants or even our pets, we're selecting particular types that we find appealing. And when we do that, we're removing from the overall pool of genetic diversity. Now the strains used to make both camembert and brie are losing their ability to reproduce. Some French authorities say it could disappear. In the future, not right now, there could potentially be threats to this fungus and this cheese. On the farm, Oud says it's just one of the many reasons making this cheese is a challenge. It starts with raw milk from cows just up the hill, heated to about 90 degrees and turned into curds, then scooped into molds. A day later, they're ready to come out, this is usually where the fungi cultures are added. So this cheese has come out of the mold and now we are flipping it over. This is gonna help make sure that all of the salt gets evenly distributed on both sides of the cheese. And we're keeping it just a little bit separated from each other to make sure that those rinds develop perfectly. It's perfect. Perfect? Yeah, it's perfect. How long do your hands smell like cheese when you're done with this? <laughs> oh, just uh, have to wash it and that's okay. Yeah? Yeah. My son told me, oh, mommy, you are smelling cheese. <laughs> the cheese matures for a few weeks before it's ready to eat. Oh, yeah. It's got this really amazing combination of creamy, but also a little bit tangy. You can mm -hmm. feel that aftertaste on your tongue. And do you like it? I love it. 
<laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> There's plenty of hope for camembert. Scientists are working to restore some of that genetic diversity. At the nearby market, this artisanal cheesemaker says that's something tiny farms with their naturally growing fungi are especially good at. We don't use chemicals, for example, to wash uh, the mammal of the, of the cows. I think if you are small and if you keep your, uh, as you say, uh, natural ferment in your farm, it's okay. Everything is okay. If we're excited about the fact that as we go forward, each camembert you try is going to have its own personality and have its own flavor, then that's what we can look forward to, I think. So if you're worried about your favorite French cheese suddenly disappearing, the good news is you don't have to be. But in the future, we might have to get used to our cheeses having a slightly different color, maybe smelling a bit funkier, but definitely no less delicious. Smelling a bit funkier. I did not think Josh would go there. Josh Letterman, thanks for that. I learned a lot. Finally tonight, we want to send you into your weekend with 60 seconds of joy. Tonight, meet a 12-year-old boy from Massachusetts who is trying to make a difference one Easter basket at a time. Making sure every child has a happy Easter. The eggs. That is 12-year-old Worcester resident Josh Soudan's wish. I feel very happy knowing that each one of these hopes out somebody. Josh's Easter baskets for the homeless is an idea that started in 2020 after Josh and his family visited his aunt and cousin at a homeless shelter. So we have gotten donations from Canada, Nevada, Indiana, and Tennessee so far. Opening the packages and reading the notes from so many people is Josh's favorite part. Keep changing the world from Catherine. But shortly after last year's Easter, the Saudin family received an eviction notice. It wasn't the greatest feeling. Despite the struggles they faced, they will be donating hundreds of baskets this year. Josh says he hopes to one day help kids all around the world. I don't want to get anything. I hope other kids can get stuff. It's not in about me. It's about the kids. Oh, what a good guy. And that's going to do it for us tonight. I'm Stephen Romo. We'll see you right back here on Monday. Until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.